Well, thank you, Ashley, and uh, thank you, Alberto. These have been wonderful presentations. It makes a nice, cohesive whole. <clears throat> and if I can orient our audience, we are going to take some time now for a bit of a panel discussion. Um, a bit belatedly, I'm going to draw your attention to the other panels on your screen. There is an opportunity to ask questions of the panel. Um, uh, you can submit those questions in the Q&A section. Uh, there are also some polling questions. We hope that you have uh, had a chance to respond to those polling questions, one for each presentation as we've moved along. Um, this panel discussion we'll have here on this site, so you don't have to go anywhere, but in about 15 minutes, um, if there are still questions, and we believe there will be, um, we're going to do the virtual equivalent of stepping out of the big presentation room and moving out into the corridors and moving out into side rooms. We're moving to a breakout session where we'll continue with the questions and answers. And I know some people have already submitted some truly interesting questions. Um, let me just see, is um, Alberto online? Can we hear you? Yes, can you see me? I think so. And uh, Ashley, you're still there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect. If, if I may then, let me um, um, offer up some questions that have been posed by our audience. Um, here's an interesting one, Alberto. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. the question was about the biomarkers. And of course, we've talked a lot about biomarkers for severe asthma. And the questioner says very simply, is this biomarker approach relevant in mild to moderate asthma? Interesting question. Very much so. Um, I think uh, we, are, we are moving towards biomarker everywhere, towards treatable trait, I would say. So we have a biomarker identifying a trait and a proper treatment for this trait. As you said, it has been uh, mandatory for severe asthma. There was no other option, particularly when, when monoclonal antibodies came around. And uh, uh, the same approach is now, is now widening up to the other uh, degree of severity. We have initial data from um, uh, uh, mild asthma, which tells us that they are relevant. Um, I'm, I'm talking about uh, biomarker use for treatment because, in general, we know they are, they are, they are important. But biomarker can be prognostic of efficacy of treatment. What we need is more data on uh, a trial relating them to biomarker. Uh, plenty of them in severe asthma, some, few, some in mild. Uh, the bigger part of it is, is just related to the pathology of the disease rather than uh, uh, efficacy of treatment. I expect so. I uh, will get there. Um, we need more evidence. As you say that, I think about pheno, and David Price did an interesting study looking at pheno as <clears throat> predictive of responsiveness to inhaled steroids and a very simple approach uh, in primary practice in, in mild asthma. In fact, in his paper, if I, if I recall it correctly, um, there wasn't even an attempt to really diagnose asthma. It was an attempt to address the treatable trait of elevated pheno. Is that sort of portfolio of biomarkers you, you think we might be using? Well, in I, think can be, I think can this, this, from my viewpoint, this comes after having a trial with biomarker, like we did in severe asthma, with biomarker driving a treatment. Then we can yeah. have in real life what happens, which I, I um, it's, we have to do it because then it's real life that apply. But the idea of getting, uh, uh, sorry, Ashley, in real life before going into uh, uh, um, randomized, I think it's uh, it's well, it's 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 not the, still not the proper way. Um, uh, can I ask? Can I ask Alberta whether you, whether you thought whether you thought the whether you thought pheno in fact in patients with asthma is a measure of adherence? Yeah, um, uh, I think pheno is a measure. Yeah, I think it's the simplest one, the, th the simplest matter to, to, to go through uh, to an adherence assessment. It's not specific, but it's the best, it's the simpler probably you can get through, yes. Let me add that in patients who are adherent, who are perhaps observed to use their inhaled steroids and who still have an elevated pheno, 
it's a very compelling marker that their disease has become systemic and we need things like systemic corticosteroids or biologic therapies to address that severe asthma. Absolutely. It, it, I, I, I don't know what the trend has been in Europe, but certainly in North America, we have not seen, I think, enough use of uh, exhaled nitric oxide. I think it was initially misunderstood, and I think it's it's been neglected. I know my colleagues in pulmonary medicine in Canada, at any rate, are quite anxious to uh, to adopt measurements of exhaled nitric oxide. Yeah, it's like all new things, isn't it, Ken? You know, first of all, it's the answer for everything, and then it's the answer to nothing, and eventually you work out <laughs> exactly where its value is. It's clear it's valuable, but working out yeah. exactly where, and as Alberto says, you know, you need a randomized control trial to start with to see where you are, and then you need to see how it works in a real-world population next. Sounds like the trajectory for marriage there that you were describing. I just couldn't help it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, Ashley, I have a question or two for you, a very basic one about real-world effectiveness studies, which is how do you balance the imbalances in the populations, the things that could confound your results? Uh, well, I think, first of all, you have to do them very large. <laughs> That's quite important. <laughs> I think you have to randomize them so that you at least smooth out some of the inequalities. I mean, the trick, of course, is that to know how you handle the fact you're giving people a new inhaler, uh, a new device maybe, a new drug, and maybe it's simpler once a day in a new device like that. And so uh, versus what people have been using for a long time, and I, th I think therefore it needs to be very long. I think that in the first few, few weeks you, you can't, it's like having a new, a new toy to play with, you know. But actually I think that those things evolve with time. And, and I'm confident about the results of Salford because 12 months later, the data was just as good as at three months. So, Good. Um, here's a question, uh, comes back to Alberto again about biomarkers. Um, a lot of focus, understandably, on eosinophils. Uh, what about other biomarkers? And, mm -hmm. and the questioner posed specifically the question uh, in terms of neutrophils and lymphocytes. And I might just add, uh, what about neutrophil lymphocyte ratio? It's sort of been there, then we've ignored it. Um, what do you think about other biomarkers? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll get to the same point. I think that these are all traits, um, and I think we have to move from the concept of treatable traits to traits in general, though Alvar is not happy. But I think <laughs> that, uh, um, yeah, eosinophils have moved from traits to treatable traits, because we have done trials showing that by using eosinophil, we can um, predict uh, the outcome in terms of efficacy of treatment. Uh, I expect it's not only related to eosinophils, it's the simplest one, but uh, as you mentioned, there are other biological markers, and Fino is going on the same way, but it's only on T2. Now we can add the other one. Other one on T2, I think they will follow easily now, because the path is is um, is already uh, very well oriented, um, but I expect the other one are are, uh, um, are um, will come out. They are still trait. We don't have the possibility of having a specific treatment on them. So I agree they are overlooked, but there is a reason why. Because uh, this, uh, in addition to describing how they are, it's difficult then to apply a specific uh, management to the other traits until now. There's a question about uh, asthma-related quality of life. Uh, where does that fit into our portfolio of, of outcome measures? Uh, I think it's a question for all of us. Uh, Alberto, Ashley? I think it's the bedrock of what we do, isn't it? I mean, I think it's no good making somebody's eosinophils go away if they're still symptomatic. So I think it, it, it especially because quality of life I think is well related also to exacerbations too, so that they sort of tend to go hand in hand, I think. So I think that the two keys for me would, if you have somebody with, you know, a, a, a good, well controlled by quality of life measures, that actually they feel well is the first thing. Um, and, the, and the second thing is they're much less likely to exacerbate. So I think uh, I, I use them in everyday practice. I think it's important. Uh, to me to measure them, uh, I don't think they're just trial-based thing, thing tools. They're certainly not 
as well received by the regulatory authorities, which I think is why we don't see the quality of life scores being used as often. Alberto, you were going to say yeah, something. No, yeah, I, I agree with what, uh, what it has been said. I think it's the sum of uh, many different outcomes. That's also why I think it is probably less uh, granular than the other one, and that's why the authority might not like it because it's just it comes I, I mean it's the closest one to real life but it's probably the less specific indeed indeed um i might say that just as a quick aside that there there are some there are some symptoms that are tractable and some less so so i think that you know particularly cough for example is, uh, you know, I think there are novel therapies that might come along as part of the therapeutic armamentarium for asthma down the line in two or three years, to be proven, of course. But there are other traits, you know, that, that might be important to treat, uh, that might give us a, more, a better composite in due course. The, um, there's another question here. Um, it seems like a slam dunk, but should I consider therapeutic index in clinical decision making? Um, Alberto, you, you, I think, raised the issue of therapeutic index. I think we all did, actually. Yeah, um, yeah. Like, you, 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 can, you can go first. <laughs> because you spoke well, more of this. You, you went into different ICS. Um, um, if you want, I can, but I think you, you were the one to have more details on that, weren't you? I think it's an important concept uh, that we need to bear in mind and to share with our patients the notion that our agents um, currently in use, have been developed to be topical, uh, to work on the surface, uh, and, and not to have systemic impact. And I think those are educational principles we need to share with our patients who have asthma, because many of them are concerned. Um, I have a strange um, uh, story that I share with patients as well, which is uh, the notion that using an inhaled steroid on a regular basis actually minimizes impact as opposed to intermittent. And um, it, it may seem like an odd concept, but I point out to patients that applying an inhaled steroid to a raw surface, the inflamed airway, is a time when, if there's going to be absorption into the system, that's when it's going to occur. And as you normalize the airway and restore the epithelial barrier, and those aren't the words that I use, um, there's less and less likelihood of absorption. And I'm intrigued that if I take my time and explain the notion, patients do seem to get it. Um, so um, again, therapeutic index absolutely plays into my clinical decision making, but more than anything plays into my education for patients. Um, uh, we've tweaked our agents to work where they're supposed to and not to get into the system. Um, yeah. I yeah, if I may just add, I agree with you. Uh, honestly, I think it is an important issue that goes together with other. Um, uh, and I agree on the educational side of it. <clears throat> but I wouldn't say that it's the primary one leading the decision. Um, it goes with other items. You mentioned once daily, you mentioned uh, a combination treatment. So it's one of the M and that drives the decision. I think it's. Um, I think it's. I think it's. It becomes really important in patients with severe asthma. I think when the doses are right at the top. I, mean, I, I think that you know, I, I'm old enough to remember you know patients in the Royal Brompton Hospital in 1980 or whatever it was, who were you know all our asthma patients were tiny because they'd been on oral steroids for years. Yeah. So. Don't forget, you know, inhaled corticosteroids are phenomenally safe drugs, really, con compared to the good they do. But at the top, top dose, the, the issue, I think, is going to be, you know, what's the long-term impact of uh, really high dose over a, over, over, a, you know, over a gram of inhaled steroid, FP particularly, for example, over a decade compared to a switch to a biologic. And that's going to be an interesting discussion over time. Absolutely. Um, the, um, there's another question, and I think it could take us a, a fair bit of time. It's throwing a cat amongst the pigeons. but there was a question about what about intermittent therapy versus regular therapy. Um, and, and I think I'd say whatever our strategies, 
Um, I think all of us would like most of our patients to be using regular therapy. The best outcomes are that way. The question is, is there an alternative for the non-compliant patient, the poorly compliant patient, and how quickly do you get there? And I think there's the devil in the details. Um, the questioner didn't specify intermittent as in um, treatment for six weeks in the post-viral setting versus uh, the, uh, for example, SMART or SIGMA approach. Uh, but again, I think we'd all find regular therapy is, um, and getting the use of inhaled steroids is what we're all after. How you get there and how you get patients to take sufficient amounts is, is the puzzle. Uh, and that's what we spend all of our time doing in, in clinical environments. Um, those are questions that I have in front of me now, and I see the clock oh, ticking that's right. towards. To... Yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say. Um... Was gonna say I'm, for me, it's, it's it's glaringly obvious. There's a big sign up that says, "Somebody, please do a real world trial." <laughs> you know, we need to do a real world trial of, peer, of as, as as needed versus probably Relvar, I guess, a once a day treatment, giving you the best chance of adherence and stack them up. And I guess there'll be some patients who'll do well on one and some in the other. And understanding which ones do best on each strategy would be really important rather than having a you know a pharmaceutical struggle, which is what we shouldn't be having. We should be having good science here. Which raises an interesting point about doing these trials. We're always presenting mean results, uh, but I think you just said we need to look at who does better with which, and they're clearly going to be responders to one strategy, responders to the other strategy, and, and that's what we need to hear more of. Um, are there characteristics that identify the regular therapy responder, characteristics well, that identify the symptom-driven strategies and so on. Welcome to our everyday practice, Ken. Well, <laughs> yeah, and I, 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 think it, I think this is important because this is where a biomarker can make the difference also in non-severe patients. I agree, because I think there's nothing like a signal to show people the lights are on red, you know, you've got to do something. So that's good. I agree with you, Alberto. Um, I've got a few more questions here. I'm just mindful that in one minute we're meant to be over in our breakout session. Um, I'll just read a question that's here on my screen. Uh, it says, uh, fluticasone furate, philanterol, is often used for directly observed therapy. So there's a very interesting concept, directly observed therapy. Uh, due to its once daily dosing, uh, have you seen a greater reduction in pheno with FFVI? Uh, compared to high-dose ICS lab comparators. I can't say that I can comment on that, but I'll leave the question with Alberto and Ashley, and I think we'll be moving to join the breakout session. So if other people have the same screen as I do, there is a um, uh, arrowed box that says join breakout session. I hope our entire audience moves over. It's been fun so far, and I'm looking forward to a bit more. I thank our hosts, GlaxoSmithKline, for putting this together. I thank the European Respiratory Society for a lot of technical support. It's been interesting moving to the virtual world. Um, we are sharing data and thoughts in a way we haven't before. It's been different. I've enjoyed it. I still would love to be in Vienna. Um, I look forward to getting together with everyone personally next year, fingers crossed. Uh, but in the meantime, it's been fun. Please move over with us to the uh, breakout session uh, if you have the time.